friend Faye has been for me all these years, 45 years, I believe it is. Can't beat that, can you? My topic in this series of lectures is bedtime thoughts and prayers. I've had a little teasing about that, but <laughs> we're, we're associating it certainly with our thoughts on God and getting our minds ready to pray and commune with God at night. Do you all have your sheets with the scriptures on there? The reason I handed this out is because I have made reference to all of these in my lesson. There is no way on earth I can finalize all this lesson if I go through this. But if we did nothing but read every one of these, and I did nothing but talk just reading, you would gain so much from it. That's God's word, and that's what it means to us. So I wanted you to have this. There's no way I can even make reference to all of these in our time frame. Faye, you let me know when I've got about five minutes left. As you'll see, I am not a public speaker, but I certainly don't mind trying and getting up and teaching, especially the ladies in Russia for the last 10, 11 years, off and on when I'm there with my husband. It's such a joy there because the ones that actually come, and anybody's invited, but they are very absorbent, of course, to what you say. But they listen attentively, but they honestly really try to search the scriptures for themselves, and that gives you a good feeling when you're doing that. But <clears throat> the topic, and you'll have to excuse my voice, ever since being in Russia the last time, I have really had problems with my head <laughs> more ways than one. <laughs> Prayer is so powerful, and you all know that, and I'm sure you, because I feel like, People who are here at this lectureship or any godly lectureship are the cream of the crop. You know, once you give your heart to something like this and the, you motivate yourself enough and give yourself the time to come, and you, you really have to be seeking the Lord's will, and that's what he wants from all of us. But we have to think about in the power of prayer, the power of our late-night thoughts, and that's mostly what I gained from this whole lesson. If I could just give you a, a third, no, 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 a twentieth of what I have gained from this, it would be, it would be so good. But there's no way a speaker could, could ever really do that. Now, for me, it takes an awful lot of study and preparation and time to do something like this. So bear with me and let's see what we can all gain from it. But I'm going to talk about the power of prayer, but our late night thoughts in relation to that, and then how we examine our own conscience when we're even beginning to pray and thinking about communing with God, how we conquer our fears and our worries, and do we control our thoughts? And that's a very important topic, I think, on getting ourselves ready to pray and meditate. Uh, and then the last topic, I hope we have time, is what hinders our prayers? Yeah, we want our prayers answered. We need to look for our prayers to be answered. That's the faith that we need and we have. But can we do things, or can we do it in such a way that perhaps our prayers will not be answered? Okay, according to Psalms 113 and 3, we are to praise the Lord's name from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Now, David certainly understood all of this, and remember he was a shepherd, so he enjoyed such things as communing with God in the night, uh, in his night watches. And Psalms 63, 5 through 6, he said, my soul shall be satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips when I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee at my night watches. Can't you just see David out there with his sheep? Of course, being a shepherd, he was there day and night, I'm sure, at times. But he always rejoiced in the fact that God was with him and he could use that strength in his everyday life. Well, I think of prayer like this as a beautiful gift that not only that God has given us, but that we give ourselves. Because we are the ones that have to initiate it, isn't it? <clears throat> it's a gift that we can open every day, all day long, as long as we live. It's there for the taking. And that's what God wants us to make ourselves available to his resources that he's given us. And that is a great resource we can have to give us the confidence we need to live day by day. By the end of the day, we may be very tired physically and also emotionally. But what do you see so many people doing? Just plopping down in front of that one-eyed monster and saying, oh, let me just relax a little bit. You know, they may say that an hour or two or three. Well, we know that it does not relax us in such a way that we can commune with God. Not really. It doesn't put you in the mood for that. Sometimes it can make us feel a lot worse, can it? 
Now, anything can relax us if, if we choose to meditate on relaxing. There's all kinds of things we could do to get our minds ready for such, like you know, bedtime rituals that people go through. But if we avail ourselves of what God has made possible for us, and we can reach out to God and relax through, through, his, uh, through his help. Um, we must never forget, though, that big concern of the devil is to keep us from praying. And I imagine in your life you have experienced, like I have, there are things that come up that you think, oh, is this the old devil working on me so that I don't commune with God like I should? And, you know, he must really laugh at our toils and mocks at our wisdom that we gain through God. But I picture the devil as trembling when we pray. And just try that. It makes you feel better to know you're, you're fighting the devil like that. But I've heard it said that prayer is one of the mightiest weapons that God has placed in our hands. Now, you've heard so many statements by J. Edgar Hoover, a a long-time former uh, director of the FBI. Well, he said, the spectacle of a nation praying is more awe-inspiring than the explosion of an atomic bomb. That's pretty powerful. And he went on to say, the force of prayer is greater than any possible combination of man-made or man-controlled powers because prayer is man's greatest means of tapping the resources, the infinite resources of God. Have you ever thought about that? That when you approach God in prayer, that we're tapping the very infinite resources of God? Now, that's not an inspired statement, but I certainly believe that's true. One thing that I've learned early in life is blessed hour of prayer what a balm for the weary oh how sweet to be there if we'd had that in our songbook I would have had Faye lead that but I didn't see it there and one th- thank you Faye one thing that reminds me of this so much is when Eric our youngest son was a junior in high school we were heading back home from a little <clears throat> trip for a Thanksgiving holiday and we had a horrible accident, and Eric, we were all hurt, but mainly Eric, he was ejected out that little rear window of our little Mercury, and we rolled over several times, and, and we were on top, and we got out, Cliff and I did, and we couldn't find Eric, and then we heard that moaning over there, and we didn't know if he was about dead or what, but he was, he was hurt, and when we finally got him to the hospital, we all were there for the night, And I got on that phone immediately, and I called our oldest son, Terry. And if you know my husband, which you probably haven't met yet, but he's the rock of Gibraltar. Well, I think of my son, Terry, the same way. I really do. And not only did did he comfort me, but I asked him if he would call everybody we know nearly, all the churches all around, people that we've had communication with through the years and see if they would be praying for us and especially for Eric. Because you know the Apostle Paul, he often um, asks for the prayers of others. And we know that the combination of these prayers must truly help us reach the goals or the, the answers must come through all these combined prayers. I know it helps. And if Paul did it, why can't we do it and expect the same thing? Um, Even though Jesus was sinless, he certainly knew the power of prayer. And since the end of the first century, we have the same power in prayer. But of course, we know that we don't have miracles like they did then. And we know why. I won't go into all that. But we are told in Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace in help of need. So we need to take advantage of that. And just think about it, though. Christ has been at the right hand of God for almost 2,000 years interceding for prayer. And he's, he's not missed a single prayer. Isn't that, isn't that comforting? Oh, I just realized, are you videoing this? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I am sorry, ladies. (laughs) Oh, dear. Um, When we think about the power of prayer, though, have you noticed that there have been so many studies being taken place uh, about the 
the evidence that science gives toward the power of prayer and meditation and what it means in our life. Well, I think it's, it's interesting. Sometimes we have to take it with a grain of salt. But so many interesting ones have taken place. Um, they discover that uh, religion and spirituality reduce stress and boost the immune system. Well, la-di-da, we've known that all our lives, haven't we? <laughs> if we're Christians and faithful Christians and have that strong faith, of course we know that. And, you know, but it's good to know that the world can see this from other angles, uh, not just from uh, religious angles, from our par par point, I'm sorry. And so convinced are some of these people that the um, Center for Complementary and Alternative uh, Medicines have spent... $6.2 million studying this very thing just recently. And they were trying to get the relation between health and prayer and spirituality and meditation. And, and that's a lot of money, you know, that they will go through with that. And there are other scientific studies that even show the benefits of uh, prayer in trying to lose weight. You've probably heard about that. Conceiving a child, uh, recovering from illness, we know this, and even a longer lifespan, they say. Well, it's about time they understand that, that prayer is important, but you just wish they would learn to love the Lord, as we know that the world should. This would be a better place to live. And, and last night, hearing Brad, it just... How many of you were there? It was amazing. Of course, you know, we know this, but to hear it and see it like that before your very eyes, it just brings it all back to home. And it kind of makes you scared in a way. To, but I'll have to say, maybe that's the reason my two daughters-in-laws... Uh, they homeschool their children, and they're both, they both have great educations and were public school teachers. But anyway, I didn't mean to plug that, but that's what they're doing. I love my daughters-in-laws. They are, they are my daughters, and I, I'm so thankful for them. I'm so thankful my sons married wonderful, wonderful daughters. I told them a long time ago that, of course, they knew we'd been praying for them always to do this, and I said... No matter who you marry, you don't have to worry about me. I'm going to love them just as much as I can because I know you picked them out. And I trust you to make the right choice because you've been taught. And, and then I knew that they would trust their own feelings and as, as well, their own guidance through the Lord. But I want you to think about this. Um, when we pray... Yes, we touch the infinite resources of God. We, we have that available that we don't even know how or when or where or, or, or exactly how that works, but it's there. But we are expressing our real trust in God to provide our need. And, of course, he already knows our needs before we even ask. And we'll get into that a little bit later. It expresses our confidence that God will provide. It then produces this powerful influence on us. See, it's, if you look at it in a psychological way, you can almost explain it. But we don't have to, do we? We just take it at face value and say, thank you, God, for the power of prayer in our lives and know that our prayers are going to be answered. Um, prayer is indeed powerful, but let's put it in a perspective with our late-night thoughts. And I think that's perhaps what Maxie wanted me to do more. And some things I hadn't really put it in quite in that perspective. So this was nice for me to do. To, to. But nighttime is a good time to have a song in your heart and a prayer on your lips, as that song says. The psalmist said in uh, Psalm 42, 8, Yet the Lord will command his love and kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. If you haven't done this, try singing a song before you go to sleep at night or in, you know, in the quietness of your own uh, room. Now, I have a lot of quiet time because my husband is not there a lot. And this makes it even more possible for me to have that special time with the Lord at night. And if you sing a song or meditate on the words, you can just see, look in the mirror, you can see that peaceful expression on your face. And at bedtime especially, you want to be in a real good attitude when you pray because the way we feel, the way we think, the way we've been acting that day can affect how we commune with God, or maybe we don't commune with, with God, perhaps. But we know that sometimes it's very difficult for us to pray about certain things, and even, <clears throat> even I have said, God, I don't know how to pray about this, but please know my heart, and please know, help me to understand more fully. But, and, and that's a comfort, too, that we know that He and the Holy Spirit will help us with this. 
Um, we can go through all kinds of bedtime rituals and develop all kinds of methods that would help us feel more relaxed. But the first thing we have to do is have this feeling of security, don't we? And of course, we have that through knowing that God is our helper. And what better way could you know than Psalm 23? I love that psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. Now, the next point under the power of our late night thoughts is actually, I want you to think of this verse, Psalm 4 and 4, where it says, commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Now, when you think about communing with your own heart, well, I'm not sure about you, but the first thing I thought about was, okay, let's examine our own conscience. So much of what we think and feel you know, it, it is in our conscious. Well, let's see. Let's examine our own conscious. Let's lay ourselves bare before the Lord God because we're able to see more clearly the avenues of which our conscience has been shaped. If we really think about this, and we, God already knows, but let's let us know ourselves. We'll search our conscience, and we'll also see if we're really letting go of those cares of the world that keep us from growing spiritually. And we probe and uncover things that are deeply hidden, and sometimes this can even be painful. But why not do it? God already knows all this, and sometimes it helps us to really uncover and really feel like we are bearing our soul in more ways than one to the Lord God. This kind of examination will produce humility. And I'm not saying you need humility. I mean, everybody does to a certain degree. But sometimes we can forget these things. And it gives us an awareness of who we really are. We just can't deceive ourselves at a time like this, can we? And you know what bothers me so much the older I get is to see Christians who might, as, as they mature in the faith, somehow many Christians that I have not many, are not in comparison, say, to a group like this. But they deceive themselves so easily and say maybe to themselves, well, I don't feel the same way about that as I used to. I don't feel that's a sin like I used to. And maybe it's because they're not putting it up against God's word. And one thing in, in Russia that's been hard to do is to show the people the, even the children in the school, you know, you have a standard. Well, they don't know what that standard is. They have no idea. And when you talk about have a standard, they don't even like that idea. <clears throat> but if you don't have a standard, what do you judge anything by? And it helps us, I think, to give us confidence to do this. Uh, we see in Psalm 130, verse 1, the psalmist was not afraid to cry out to God in anguish and rage and grief and despair. So why can't we? He said, out of the depths I have cried unto thee, O Lord. And we pour out our secrets and knowledge, acknowledge our failings, and, and we really open ourselves up, don't we? Ephesians 6 and 18 tells us to pray. Pray fervently with supplication, and I believe in that. Um, one thing that I want you to kind of picture is like um, a wagon wheel. When I think of Christ being in my life, in the center of li my life, I think of that wagon wheel with that little hub in the middle is what I call it, and then all those spokes going out. Well, that, if that hub is not there, you know, we're just not much good, are we? Like that wheel would not work at all. If we don't have Christ as the hub, as the center of our life, we're not going to be much good either. And, and we can be so strong in the Lord. And I wish I had more time to go into that. But listen to this verse. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. And that has been one of my favorite verses because I depend so much on God guiding me. <clears throat> now, I don't mean that he, like a robot, he leads us in these different ways. But however he chooses to do it through his providence, that's fine with me. I'm just going to trust in, in that. And, of course, since I was young, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, my favorite verses. And I remember on a tape you said it was yours. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart in all thy ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now, I live by this day by day. Because when I feel rather insufficient or whatever you want to call it, self-conscious or whatever, I depend on the Lord God leading, directing my life. Because I'm going to give myself to him. Now, if we don't give ourselves to him in the proper way, he's not going to do that, is he? 
No way. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. When we commune with God in the privacy of our home, in the privacy of our bedroom, in the privacy of our thoughts, with our own heart and opening ourselves up to God, I think at times like this, we really can conquer our fears and our worries. And there's so much that causes us to, to perhaps get this way. I've certainly had experiences in Russia to make me feel this way. But you know, in 11 years, I've never been really afraid. Now, one time when my husband was run over by this van and was hurt terribly, and for a few days, we just didn't know for sure what was going to happen. But I know this sounds almost strange to some people, but I still had peace in my heart and in my actions. I just felt God so near because I have that kind of faith that he is there to help us through all of this and that if we allow it, he will give us that trust and that faith and that confidence to go on day by day and make the best decisions because <clears throat> when we try and we know the Lord is with us, with us, that all things are going to work out for our good in the long run. It might not be exactly the way we want it or what we think it should be, but it's still going to be for our good, and that doesn't mean there won't be sorrow there, there won't be heartaches, but we learn through our circumstances and through overcoming things with the Lord's help, we learn to grow more spiritually day by day, don't we? And I think that's why it's so important for Christians to hold on to God's hand and to pray fervently with supplication, feeling his presence, feeling that presence there. And I depend on that day after day after day. Our problems seem smaller, and we uh, confidently can overcome them with God's help. By the way, I changed it up just a little bit from the book, and I don't know how many of you have bought the book, but all of the scriptures are in the book reference because I knew I've made reference, I've indicated the scriptures, but I didn't have time to actually point those scriptures out to you. So I hope you'll take your reference sheet home with you. Worry? Why worry? What can worry do? It never keeps the trouble from overtaking you. It gives you indigestion and sleepless hours at night and fills your gloom the days, however fair and bright. It puts a frown upon your face and a sharpness in your tone. You're unfit to live with others and you're unfit to live alone. <laughs> worry? Why worry? What can worry do? Well, it never keeps the trouble from overtaking you. But pray? Why pray? What can praying do? Praying really changes things and arranges life anew. It's good for your digestion. It keeps you peaceful at night and fills the grayest, gloomiest day with rays of glowing light. It puts a smile upon your face and that love note in your tone. Makes you fit to live with others and even fit to live alone. Pray? Why pray? What can praying do? It brings God down from heaven to live and work with you. Just feel his closeness every day is the one thing that I, I just want to say that to everybody I meet. How can you live without Christ in your life? How can you live without the knowledge that God is our eternal father and he's omniscient, omnipresent? He knows everything. He's there and he wants us to be there with him. He's our God, our father. We are his child. That's what it's all about. And thinking about the power of our late night thoughts, another thought that came to my mind is, do we control our thoughts or do we let our thoughts control us? Now, I think as Christians, this is very, very important. You know, the trick to controlling our thoughts, though, is to tell our brain <laughs> who's in control. You know, we have to work at this, of course. It's not going to just happen. Probably the best time to do this is when we're falling off to sleep at night. I want to read you something that my sister told me that a doctor, when she was talking to a doctor, he said this. And it just makes you realize that we can determine our feelings and our thoughts and our next day's feelings. He said, my, she said, my doctor talked at length about this and how important it is at night just before going to sleep to think and to dwell on good things. And he said that just before sleeping, as you think on these things, they go into your subconscious. We were talking about that last night. They go into your subconscious mind, and there they stay. And they can determine the peace of mind that you have and even the attitudes of the next day. 
as you keep putting all of these things into your subconscious mind, the better you're going to feel that day. And even the day, as you keep doing this, you will continue to feel better the next day and the next. The brain is more active to your buoyant thoughts than to your negative thoughts. Well, we know that, but it still helps to hear other people say that. But we have to work at this, don't we? It's not something that just comes so easily to all of us. We have to work at wiping away those negative thoughts and train ourselves to see the beauty of God's peace that we have as his child. And if we work at pushing and closing that door, it will happen, it will happen for us. Don't dwell on frustrations and negative statements of others. And, you know, you can be around people who are negative and who make you feel rather badly by them continually talking down about things or talking about others or just being negative in general. But don't dwell on that because it'll only make you feel worse. But what's going to happen if we, if you let ourselves do this, you're going to be caught up in the same thing. But Philippians 4, 11, it says, Paul said, I have learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. Now remember, he was in prison at that time, but he could still say he was content. He'd learned those external circumstances in our life it really are not what determines how we feel and the way we act. It's our thoughts. It's our thoughts that determine it. And we have our, our middle son is adopted, and he has a bit of a negative attitude a lot of times. Bless his heart. He has some limitations, but uh, I keep trying to show him this, and it's still hard for him to always remember. It's a learning process, though, in our spiritual growth as Christians, I think. We have to keep working at that. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In working on controlling our thoughts, the one thing that we can remember is uh, the scientists are saying that optimists live longer than pessimists, and they've had all these studies that show that. And, of course, I believe that because if we center our life around Christ, we're going to be a lot more optimistic. Um, one study said that they, they said people with um, positive thoughts may live at least 20 years longer than people with negative thoughts. Now, that's quite a study. But Mayo Clinic also discovered that the importance of having optimistic outlook in life uh, and what it could mean in your life. And they studied 839 people through a period of, I think they said, 30 years. And they said those who expect mix misfortune and see the darker side of life don't live as long as those who have that more optimistic view. Now that was quite a study. And like I say, you can put a little validity in scientific research, yes, and let it sink in as much as you can, but we know these things, don't we? And like I said, it still helps. But pessimism, one doctor said, and one study said, is a habit. And that these people that form these habits early in life, they should go into some kind of treatment and learn not to be pessimistic, but to be optimistic. He said you can do that. But you remember that song, um, Don't Worry, Be Happy? <laughs> I thought that was pretty good, actually. It, it, anything that will help us. But I'll never forget Paul Faulkner and Carl Burkeen a long time ago said, fake it till you make it. And I mean to tell you that works. It works. Fake it till you make it. And I think that means that even though you don't feel like it, you don't want to, you smile. And you, you just start acting better. Well, pretty soon, these feelings are going to rise up to those actions. And it does work. And, you know, I can not feel so good, but I'll go to the mirror and I'll just make myself smile. And, man, I start feeling better instantly. I really do. If you let yourself do that, it works. And so I, I really appreciated that little bit of wisdom a long time ago, and it went a long way with me. We never know for sure why people become so pessimistic. It could even be a genetic thing. Who knows? And then being around people. <laughs> Don't punch her. I saw that. <laughs> I'm, not I'm not punching her. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we have to work on each other, don't we? <laughs> That's all right. But thinking about those blessings. My, my husband used to say, you always see everything out in the audience, and they never think you see anything. <laughs> but if we're genuinely grateful, this is another thing that can help us have an optimistic attitude. Uh, and meticulously naming our blessings name by, uh, one by one, we can't help but feel better, can we? Man, I live by this every day. I must be one of the happiest persons on earth when it comes to counting your blessings because I do that all the time. It's, it's a habit, and it helps put me in a better frame of mind. 
that verse in Ephesians 5 and 20. Giving thanks always for all things unto God. And that goes a long way in our life. Maybe we should be like that optimistic old lady that said, hmm, I only have two teeth, one upper and one lower, but, oh, they do meet. <laughs> <laughs> that, that helps, doesn't it? <laughs> Here's another we, reason that we can control our thoughts. We can control our thoughts. Proverbs 23 and 7. As he thinketh in his heart, I have only 10 minutes. Ooh. Okay. Uh, but anyway, how we fill our hearts with what we fill our hearts with and our minds will, will determine the kind of life we live. I thoroughly, thoroughly believe that. And I think that's why he says, you know, to study as he does and put that into our hearts because, um, you know, they used to say you are what you eat. A long time ago I heard that. But, you know, we are what we think. And don't ever forget that. We are what we think. Philippians 4, 8, and 9. So let me skip on over some of this. Um, <clears throat> Okay, prayers that are answered, what do we look for? Our late-night thoughts are so important because they can determine if we have a peaceful night's sleep or even the way we pray. And if we pray scripturally, now there is such a thing as not praying scripturally, but if we pray scripturally, we expect our prayers to be answered, don't we? And we should, and he's given us all the reason for that. Um, but keeping in mind what we need to think of in some areas that can cause our prayers to be hindered. There's several I've got. I've got 11 written down here. We're not going to have time for that. Feelings of doubt or lack of faith hinders prayer. We, we know very much about that. James 1, 6 through 7, let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. All these verses are so good. I wish I could have done nothing but just read the verses. We would have gained so much from it. Make sure there's no skepticism in your heart. God, God is so willing and he's so powerful that he responds to our prayers. Never, never forget that. Besides, faith is not only knowing that God has heard your prayer, but it is the assurance that that answer is on the way. Of course, we already know it may be yes, it may be no. It may be in another way. It may be in another time. God's time frame is not our own, is not ours. And that's one thing that's a little hard to remember sometimes. Um, but just don't ever forget, that answer's out there, and you need to be looking for it one way or another. Sometimes you might miss it because it may come in a different form. It may even come in the way you study God's Word. It may come with your associations with other people. There's just other ways and means that God can answer our prayer in his own time frame. And see what confidence that gives us because we know it doesn't depend on us or our circumstances or anything. It depends on how God wants to answer because of his all-powerful knowledge of what's best for us. Romans 8, 28. We, we feel confident about that, don't we? And even when my husband was so hurt, and, and, and that's happened, he's been in the hospital three or four times over there, and it's been very vital, you know, at a, at a time. It could cause so much worry if you allowed it to, but you know somehow God is going to work all this out to our good. I mean, even if, ladies, even if death were to occur, in the long run, God will take that and somehow we get through it and good eventually can come from it. And if my husband were to die on the mission field, you know, I would not feel so badly about that because that's exactly where he wants to be. And our children know that. They understand that. He's 71, so you know about how old I am. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. That's where he wants to be and how he wants to live his life. And I don't stand in his way. I can't always go, and he understands that, because I have everything to take care of at home. And that's a big responsibility. I wish I could go into that, but I won't. <laughs> uh, feelings of doubt and lack of faith hinders prayer. We, we, you know, that's very much true. But are we strong enough? When you think about things that keep us from praying, the old devil wants us not to pray. Are we strong enough? Are we spiritually mature enough to resist that devil? Well, you know we're not unless we put on the whole armor of God. You know what that is. You know the truth and righteousness, the love of God, the faith, that strong faith, and putting everything he's told us and through his word and putting that into our life and making us feel confident that resists the devil, but we have to know he's out there. We do, don't we, that roaring lion? He's not going away, and confident Christians can often fail, and we do. But we have to pick ourselves up again because we know Christ. God will keep us in the long run and forgive us of our sins.
We do not ask. That hinders prayer. We do not ask so often. But I have taught my children since they were very little to pray very specifically, and I, I want to get into that. Um, but Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or even think. Now that's really something. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we even ask or think because of that power that we have through the Lord. And he, it says in that verse, to all generations forever and ever. So he's talking about everybody. <laughs> you have that power through the Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing, though, we need to remember, he does not open doors if we don't knock. I really believe that. We're his children, but we need to love him and obey him enough that we seek him and we knock and we expect an answer. Um, we miss so many blessings by not praying to God as we should. The, the, the non-praying Christian does, and certainly the non-Christian does. We at number four, we ask amiss or with the wrong motives. And we know that Mark 11, 24 says that you'll receive whatsoever you ask. But God doesn't expect us to ask for things that are unrighteous, not Christians. And he is uh, our father. He knows when we've asked amiss. But we honest with ourselves and let him fulfill his purpose in our life. Let me repeat that. Let him fulfill his purpose in our life. We don't always know what that is, do we? But depend on him to fulfill that purpose. Number five, we have an unforgiving spirit. Now, I really wanted to go into this because it is so prevalent in, in, in throughout the church. You know, it, the forgiveness of our sins is dependent on whether or not we forgive those who sin against us. And, and I see this too much in the church. Of course, we look, have to look at ourselves and tell ourselves and remember that we don't wear our feelings on our shoulders and we're not so sensitive that we get hurt so easily. We need, as Christian women, to give, it, uh, give each other the benefit of the doubt. Amen. Love each other enough, accept each other enough with our failings and our faults, because God is the one to forgive. But if they really hurt us, let's ask ourselves, am I too sensitive? Am I looking for this? You know, and then we can go from there. But I think that's really important as Christian women. Colossians 3.13, for bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Um, I better skip on. I wanted to read this too. This is something my sister, um, she sent to me. She knew I was going to do this. And she said, many years ago, <clears throat> I started something that made it easier for me to forgive another who had been mean-spirited or had been hateful about things. On my knees and in my heart, I would take the hands of those who had all against me or me against them, and I would take their hand and go to the throne of God and pray. Now, in her mind and in her heart, this is what she's doing. And she said, you cannot have a bitter thought toward your enemy or someone, you know, like an enemy perhaps, or someone who you have all against. You can't have bitterness if you do this before the throne of God, and you visualize this in your head. Um, and she also said that, you know, in doing this, I even... Forgive myself of things that I... Because we forget sometimes that the Lord God has forgiven us. We need to forgive ourselves. Um, this will not happen, she said, unless the cup of bitterness is taken from us. And don't let the, the resentment of all this or even our guilt keep us from praying. God gives us the strength to overcome so much and to begin again and again. And then with this renewed strength, we can live faithful, Christian, beautiful lives. And I think Christian, faithful women are beautiful. Beautiful. I really do. And, and I, you know, I think women are so strong anyway. Christian women <clears throat> are so strong. And I think we, sh we should be and we can be. And there's no reason why we aren't. And we should feel confident in ourselves. And, of course, some of your husbands may not, may not be like mine. He likes me to be independent, <laughs> and so I am. But, I mean, it just came natural anyway. But he is the head of the house, and believe you me, he's my rock and always has been and always will be. And uh, I thank God for him all the time. Uh, refusing to do our part will hinder our hearts. And if you have the book, I hope you will finish reading the rest of this because I I really think this is very important. We need to be willing to do what we ask God to help us with. I mean, we could say, God, help me, to, um, help me to go across the street and teach somebody. But even be more specific. Help me to, to talk to Helen about Christ and help me to be able to get over my fears. 
you know, we need to be very specific and don't, don't let anything hinder our prayers. Okay. Well, <laughs> so that means I better. Oh, you all, this is good. I hate to miss this part. <laughs> oh, we can hinder our prayers by not praying specifically. I won't go into that, but I think that is so important. Pray specifically. If you were to call up a Chinese restaurant and say, Oh, I want some food, please. That won't work, will it? If you call up the pharmacy and say, I need a medicine for so-and-so. Mm-mm. You have to have a prescription, don't you? You have to be specific. Well, certainly in prayer, we need to be specific. How will we know when our prayers are even answered if they're too general? And we need to look for those answers and feel confident they're going to be there. Being ungrateful, not praying in Jesus' name. Of course, you heard idle words and even having fusses with your spouse and stuff like that. Take time to pray. All this is detrimental. <clears throat> All we've talked about, which seems so... <laughs> anyway... Forgive my inefficiency, but God knows I try, and that's all I can do, and I don't worry about it. Just help me, okay? <laughs> okay, what a blessing it is to have a strong prayer life, and it's so important. It is a gift. Nighttime is a good time to enhance our spiritual, our physical, and our mental well-being. Let's not be crawling around like, <clears throat> excuse me, like the old, uh, crow awkwardly flapping its wings trying to start. Let's soar like that eagle. God has promised us that we can. All we have to do is accept his promises, Isaiah 40, 31. True happiness is found only in doing God's word, nowhere else. As we settle in for a good night's sleep, may we always remember a clear conscience is a soft pillow. That means so much. There's a thought, though, I'd like to leave with you, and I'm closing with this. Do you remember that movie, E.T., where he pointed that crooked finger and he said, home, Elliot, home. Well, I think about that really in relation to our life. You know, no matter how, get, how good it gets here, how many blessings and what all we overcome and how, how we feel in this life, we're still not home, are we? God is our Father. He made us. We want to be with him. He wants us there with him. We are not home. Let's go home. And let's have that glorious life forever and ever. And we can. There's no reason why we can't. Oh, to be like the blessed Redeemer. I love that song. This is our constant longing and prayer. Thank you so much. You've been such good listeners. 